What's up everybody, Nathan Brown here at the FCPR Proving Grounds at Lamrock Rock Park, and today I'm here to talk a little bit about 997-911s. The 997-911 is possibly one of the more I don't know, is it a modern classic? It probably is. It's really where modern water-cooled Porsches really came into their own in terms of the 911 model. Obviously, we had the 996. It was very polarizing. It was kind of loved. It was very hated, depending on who you were. Uh, but the 997 really took all of the mechanical improvements to the 996 and made it that much better by draping it in a better body and a better look. It's more classic 911, and it really kind of gives you the vibe that you expect from Porsche. So before we dive into all the little individual differences that are uh, present on the 997 models, we can cover a lot of the things that are the same between the 996 and the 997. If you haven't already checked it out, go view the 996 buyer's guide video. It really dives in deep on a lot of those specific components and can probably bring you up to, to speed on where we're at on the 997. The 997 models range from around 2005 all the way up to about 2013, and there's quite a few different models, variants, variations, and specifications to cover. Uh, so let's get to it. To start off, we'll start with the very first 997 models. Those are the 997.1. Those were introduced in 2005 and were mechanically very, very much a carryover from the 996. So speaking of that, the 997 could be almost considered like a 996 update, not a facelift exactly, but sort of similar to that. So the 997 being Porsche's flagship sports car is basically competing with any other high-end sports car of a similar type. So that's gonna be your Chevrolet Corvette, uh, your BMW M3s, um, possibly a couple of English or British makes like Aston Martins and things like that. And while that kind of gets into the exotics, uh, that really does span the range of uh, most of the competition for the 911. So the 997 comes immediately following the 996-911, introduced in 2005. So if you are looking at a 911, 997.1 or .2, if you pop the hood, there is a build sticker on the underneath of the hood, which will specify all of the different options that that model has. So when it comes to deciphering what it may have been equipped with from the factory, that may be a point in the right direction. So starting off, you have your standard Carrera and Carrera S models, which are both rear wheel drive. Those are both available in either a six-speed manual or a Tiptronic engine. From there, you go to your all-wheel drive models. That's Carrera 4 and Carrera 4S before you move into your turbo. Now, the Porsche Turbo obviously still maintains all-wheel drive, same as the 996 does, but bumps up the horsepower quite a bit from the standard model and goes to your Mesger by turbo engine. From there, you go to the GT series. So that's going to be your GT3.1. Uh, that comes in both a standard GT3 model and a GT3 RS, which is the more aggressive and sporty version with the big graphics. And then you get into GT2. In GT2, you have your standard GT2 model and then your GT2 RS. Much like the GT3 RS, you have your I don't wanna call it plain vanilla, but a little bit less ostentatious body design on the standard model, and then the more aggressive motorsport look on the RS. The GT2 RS was not available in the US market, but as one of the most famous and certainly the highest performance 911 models, I figured I'd throw that in there for you. Moving over to the 997.2, that's basically a facelift version of the 911 997 and features a number of aesthetic upgrades and mechanical upgrades. Similar to the 997.1, you have your base model Carrera and Carrera S, you have your all-wheel drive models, the Carrera 4 and Carrera 4S. Porsche also introduced a new sort of mid-range performance GT model, they're called the GTS. You still have your turbo, they introduced or reintroduced the Turbo S for the 997.2, which is even more powerful than the standard turbo model. Once we get beyond the turbo, we move into our GT models. So we have a slightly expanded range here and a couple of different options. You have the GT3 and the GT3 RS, which feature increased displacement over the previous .1 version. You have your GT3 RS 4.0, which is a single year model, high output, very, very different from every other 997 actually. And then you move into your top range GT2 model, which is available as a GT2 RS. So in addition to all the standard 911 coupe models, you did have a couple of summer motoring options. The first is your traditional classic 911 Cabriolet or convertible, and the second is the Targa. So the Targa is kind of a nice model that's somewhat in between a coupe and a convertible. It is worth noting that all the 997 Targa models are only available in all-wheel drive.
So now that we've covered the general range of all the 997s, it can be a little bit challenging to figure out which one is which. And there's a couple easy cues. First off, you kind of have to think about how Porsche thinks about their design. They tend to do the same thing over and over, which is to say the first variation of a chassis update is usually a little smoother, a little less edgy, a little less aggressive. So the earliest 997.1 models are gonna have slightly smoother bumpers, less aggressive spoilers. For example, the GT3 has what they call a taco wing, which is a lot smaller than the 997.2 GT3 wing. LED tail lights and LED turn signals are a dead giveaway in terms of the, of the, the blinkers and the lights and things like that. On the GT models, so like GT3, the one models all have a standard five lug while the DOT2 models all go to center lock. That also covers the turbo models as well. Moving to the DOT2 models, like I said, the GT3 has a much more aggressive rear wing on it. Generally speaking, the body lines are a little more crisp on the bumpers and things like that, but just like the 996, the core of the body is actually the same between those models. The powertrain really, really varies quite a bit on 997s, and that's because the DOT 2s totally changed everything in terms of mechanicals and technology. So while the early 997s really carried over a lot of technology from the 996, the later 997s really birthed a lot of the technology that we see in the 991 and newest Porsche 911s. That includes things like direct injection and the Lanau Legendary PDK transmission. So the earliest versions featured essentially an updated version of the M96 engine that was available in the 996. It displaces 3.6 liters, produces 325 horsepower, and 273 pounds-feet of torque. It does suffer from some of the same reliability problems, although generally speaking, it's accepted that it is more reliable than the 996 versions. You can still do the updated intermediate shaft bearing, but unlike the 996, the engine does need to be dropped in order to do it on the 997. The slightly up model Carrera S and Carrera 4S introduces the M97 variant of the classic M96 engine. It increases displacement to 3.8 liters and increases horsepower to 350 with torque rising to 300 pound-feet. So the M97 as offered in the S and 4S did have an optional X51 power pack that increased horsepower by about 30 and increased torque by about 10. The changes include higher flowing cylinder heads, different camshafts, uh, but perhaps more importantly, a deeper uh, oil sump with increased baffling. Much like the 996 turbo, the 997.1 turbo goes to the Mezger style engine, which is generally accepted as being more reliable than the M97. It is bi-turbo and intercooled. So with the turbos added, horsepower rises to 480 and torque rises to 457 pounds-feet. Moving up to the GT models, the 911 GT3 and the 997.1 is a 3.6 liter Mezger style engine. It's an evolution of the 996 version with hotter camshafts and things like that. And it produces 415 horsepower and 298 pounds-feet of torque. Just like the 996 GT3, it is an NA Screamer, revs to about 8,400 RPMs, uh, and is what you consider a classic modern 911 performance engine. The GT3 RS uses essentially an identical engine as the standard GT3, but it does use a single mass flywheel versus a dual mass flywheel. Although Porsche doesn't quote any increased horsepower numbers, generally it is accepted this model produces around 425 horsepower. Whether that is the case or not is hard to say, but that's kind of the general rule of thumb when uh, people are talking about these two specific cars. From there, we move up to the 997 GT2, which is the all-conquering rear-wheel drive turbo model. Just like the turbo and the GT3, it is a Mezger-based engine, it is bi-turbo, and it produces 530 horsepower and 505 pounds-feet of torque. One final note about both the turbo and the GT2 models is they both featured variable turbine technology, which is a first for Porsche on these models. What that essentially does is help to increase the performance of the turbocharged models over a wider range, so you have a faster spool, but you also have increased top-end horsepower at the same time. So, you might think we're done, but we are not. That was just the 997.1 models. We are now going to move on to the 997.2. Now, as I mentioned before, the 997.2 introduced a whole host of mechanical changes, most significant of which is to the engine. They moved from a port-style injection engine to a direct injection motor on all the standard 997 models. So your Carreras, your Carrera S's, and things like that. That particular engine is known to be significantly more reliable than any of the M96, M97 variants, and is essentially carried over into all of the most modern Porsche models. So any of these DOT2 models, which have the LED lights, all that stuff, are generally gonna be considered a very reliable, high-performance option, even on your base model Carrera, whereas that may not necessarily be the case on the 997.1. 
Starting at the bottom, the 997.2 Carrera and Carrera 4 feature an MA102 direct injected engine, displaces 3.6 liters and makes 345 horsepower and 289 pounds-feet of torque. The 997.2S and 4S models feature an increase to 3.8 liters of displacement on a model of this engine or variant of this engine known as the MA101. This version makes 385 horsepower and 311 pounds-feet of torque. So similar to the 997.1, the 997.2S and 4S models feature an optional X51 power pack to increase horsepower of the engine. This essentially carries over as a standard feature on the 997.2 GTS. 3.8 liters of displacement with an increased horsepower of 408 horsepower and torque which stays about the same at 311 pounds-feet of torque. Moving up to the Porsche 911 Turbo, the 997.2 is the first modern water-cooled Porsche Turbo that is not Mesger based It is MA01 based, so it is direct injected. With the benefit of direct injection, the 997.2 Turbo increases to 500 horsepower and 479 pounds-feet of torque. The 997.2 Turbo S features a standard PDK transmission and increased horsepower and torque. Horsepower goes to 530, while torque bumps to 516 pounds-feet. Moving on, we go to the GT models. First up, we have the standard GT3. The standard GT3 has a 3.8 liter Mesger based engine and produces 435 horsepower and 317 pounds-feet of torque. Unlike the 997.1, Porsche does specify a specific power increase on the 997.2 RS. Torque stays the same at 317, but horsepower does increase to 450. From there, we move to what many would consider the pinnacle of a modern water-cooled naturally acidated Porsche 911. That's the 997.2 RS 4.0. The RS 4.0 is still Mesger based. Obviously, the 4.0 would indicate an increase in displacement to four liters, and power jumps up quite a bit, all the way to 500 horsepower and 339 pounds-feet of torque. Finally, we end up with the most powerful 997.2911, that's the GT2 RS. Similar to the turbo model, it is by turbo, except this version is still Mesger based, unlike the standard turbo and turbo S. The GT2 RS takes power all the way up to 611 horsepower and a turbo S matching 516 pounds-feet of torque. Okay, so we made it through the engines. That's a lot to digest. Transmissions, things get a little more simple. standard Carrera and Carrera S models are available with either a six-speed manual or a Tiptronic S automatic transmission. Now, the Tiptronic S is still your traditional automatic with valve bodies and torque converters and things like that. It wasn't until the 997.2 that we moved into the PDK era. So in a standard Carrera or Carrera S on a 997.2, you have again a six-speed manual transmission option or a PDK. Every automatic, quote unquote, Porsche 911 from there on out is going to be a PDK model, which is really a game changer when it comes to the performance and the drivability of that car compared to the earlier Tiptronic models. So if you are looking for uh, an automatic version, the PDK is 100% the way to go. And if you do want to know a little bit more about what a PDK transmission is, which is a dual clutch transmission, we do have a video that explains that. So check that out. And we've got probably more than enough information uh, to go over as to explain all the nuance of a PDK or DSG or dual clutch transmission. Speaking in generalities, all of the GT variants, both the 997.1 and 997.2 rear wheel drive models, so that's your GT3, your GT3 RS, and your GT2 variants, are all available with a rear wheel drive six-speed manual with a limited slip differential. The turbos are available in either a six-speed or Tiptronic version on the 997.1, or a six-speed or PDK version on the 997.2. The Turbo S on the 997.2 is PDK only, not available in a manual. So the 997 Turbo.1 and .2 are the very last range topping turbos available in a manual transmission. Just like the 996, all of the turbo models in the 997 are all wheel drive. However, Porsche introduces their more modern all wheel drive system, which they dubbed Porsche Traction Management or PTM for short. This is essentially similar to some of the other active on-demand all-wheel drive systems you may be familiar with, such as 
uh, anything from Haldex or uh, Volkswagen 4Motion, things like that. But essentially, the car is rear-wheel drive or rear-biased until there is slip, and then a computer-controlled clutch activates and sends torque to the front wheels. This more dynamic and active all-wheel drive system really helped to kind of push the performance of these all-wheel drive models into the, the modern age. So as I already touched on, the 997 models are essentially identical to the 996 in terms of the general underpinnings of the chassis. So you have a McPherson strut, front suspension, and a multi-link rear suspension. The entry-level Carrera and Carrera S models have a generally a, a more sporty, a better tuned, a more responsive chassis than the early 996 models. So those are actually really nice to drive. They're a good daily driver, good commuter. With the 997, Porsche introduced PASM, or Porsche Active Suspension Management. That concept is essentially a magnetically controlled damper, which adjusts for a comfort, sport, or race mode, depending upon the driver selection. That basically helps to increase the handling while also making for a more compliant and more comfortable ride for most people. There are a couple variants available. Starting with the 997.2, there is a sport PASM option. Any 997 with the PASM suspension is about 10 millimeters lower than a standard version and any 997.2 with a sport PASM is about 20 millimeters lowered than a standard version suspension. The 911 GT3 and GT2 models all feature the more aggressively tuned racetrack-inspired suspension. This includes upgraded sway bars, ride height adjustable coilovers, and refined spring rates. All of those models, especially the GT3, are extraordinarily responsive and rewarding to drive, but on the 997.1, it still lacks a lot of the stability management and safety features that the more modern cars have. So while those are a lot of fun to drive, extremely rewarding and a lot of fun, uh, they are a bit edgy and it really takes a good driver or a very confident driver to really extract maximum performance. All that said, that doesn't mean they're something to stay away from. They're, they're really quite a lot of fun. And if you have the means and the ability to get one, I would recommend it. Much like many other 911 models, many of the suspension components are transferable from the higher end, more sporty 997 models like the GT3 down to the standard Carrera models. There are some variations you do need to be careful of. For example, sway bars require a different sway bar end link or a different sway bar mounting point on certain models. But generally speaking, if you wanna add the adjustable camber or anything else like that, you can do so from model to model and really upgrade and improve the performance of the base model Carreras to near GT3 spec. It is also worth noting that in any of these models, including the 996, if you lower the vehicle too much, you will start to introduce a significant amount of toe steer or bump steer into the chassis, which means it will be very, very unstable over bumps while you're going through corners. There's plenty of aftermarket kits to correct for that, but if you do lower your car, I would strongly recommend looking into those as an option, especially if you take your car on track. So in terms of brakes, Porsche generally kept their same color coding from model to model. That is to say that all the 997 Carrera models are generally going to feature black calipers. S or turbo models and GT3 models are going to feature red calipers. And any 997 featuring the PCCB, carbon ceramics, are going to have yellow calipers. The entry-level vari variations, the 997.1, basically have 996 carryover brakes four piston Brembos at all four corners. The Carrera S models from the 997 range all carried over 996 turbo brakes. So that is a 330 millimeter disc all the way around. Moving on to the 997.2 GT models, the GT3 RS features a 380 millimeter disc upsized from the 350 on the 997.1. The PCCB carbon ceramics are standard on the GT2 models and the Turbo S models. And while very long wearing and offering excellent performance in the street, they're very often swapped out for track use because of the cost associated with replacement. While we're talking about brakes, we should also talk a little bit about wheels. The 997 Generations is when Porsche introduced the center lock wheel option on many of their models. The 997.2 GTS, Turbo S, GT2, and GT3 all feature center lock wheels as standard. It is worth noting, however, that those are optional on any Porsche that carries the PCCB brake upgrade. For example, the Porsche Turbo behind me features the Porsche Turbo S brake package and wheel package, although it traditionally would have come with a five lug wheel. In addition to everything that we talked about, there's always going to be a number of options that were available from Porsche on certain models and certain years, whether that's limited edition variations with special colors, 
paint a sample, or aero kit and body kit options. It is also worth noting that all of the GT3 RS models came with an option for a somewhat loud graphics package. Those are usually some of the most popular models as they really stand out. Finally, we move to the interiors, and it's on the interior that Porsche has finally returned to form compared to the 996. While the 996 was a bit of a letdown for many people, the 997, although similar in sort of overall aesthetic, I would say, you see a huge improvement in the quality of the materials, the tactile touch, the feel, the, the switches, all of those things are improved over the 996. And when you get in one of the 997s, especially if it's back to back with a 996, you can really tell that Porsche has begun to put content and quality back into the interior of these cars. So we've gone through the whole range of 997 models. We've touched on a lot, of the, a lot of the different individual specific differences from year to year and car to car. And what buyer's guides come down to is, is this a car that you should buy? And generally speaking, I would say yes. It really comes down to price and what you can afford and what you're looking to get out of the car. I'd say more than almost any other model from Porsche, 997s have a very wide range of values. The entry level 997.1 versions, the Carrera S, uh, for example, is gonna be one of the more common ones that you can find. That doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be an inexpensive car. Those are generally still gonna set you back in the $30,000 range or a little more. As you move into the higher end models, whether it's a newer model with direct injection and PDK, or it's a range topping model like a turbo or a GT model, the price is gonna go up quite a bit. But the reward of owning and driving these cars also goes up substantially. One of the things that you'll see is that like most other Porsche models, 997s have begun to appreciate pretty significantly. So where you could buy a 997.1 GT3 for maybe 60, 70, $80,000 five years ago, you're probably not gonna get one of those for under $100,000, and it's not necessarily gonna be a low mileage unit either. When you start to get into the really rare models like the RS, you can expect to spend well over 100,000, perhaps over 200,000 or more dollars on one of those models. The RS 4.0, if you got deep pockets, go for it, but most people forget about it. Those cars are outrageously expensive and are probably gonna spend more than $500,000 on an example. If you are looking for absolute maximum performance from one of these cars, the Turbo or Turbo S is probably gonna be your, your, your go-to. Uh, you can get a 997.2 or 997.1 Turbo for somewhere in the 80,000 to a little over $100,000 range. And in terms of horsepower and performance per dollar, those are a very good buy. Lastly, um, one of the things that's good to consider about any of the 997 models is that Porsche has always kind of been known as providing a reliable daily driver supercar sort of product for people. A 911 is a car that you can drive on the track, you can take it to the grocery store, and you can take it on long trips. And it's generally not gonna beat you up and it's gonna be a lot of fun to own. And the 997 really kind of brings that back in a lot of different ways where the earlier 996s maybe lost a little bit of that luster. Ultimately, I see the 997 as being a modern classic. It's already a future classic, I suppose. If you're looking to get into a 911, it's probably one of the best ones you could choose. So if you wanna learn a little bit more about these cars or similar cars, be sure to check out some of our other content, our 996 buyer's guide, some of our DIYs. We do have quite a range of information available here on our YouTube channel or over on the blog on fspr.com. Likewise, if you've enjoyed the video, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, please feel free, drop them in the comments below. Obviously throw us a like, throw us a subscribe if you would be so kind. Uh, and with that, hopefully I will see you in the next video.